So uh, thanks very much for joining us. My name is Darren Ever. I manage the Green Campus Program for Antarctica. Um, this webinar is part of uh, Green Week. Um, so we're looking at rewilding and outdoor education. We're delighted to be joined by Rachel Geary, the National Coordinator of the Learn About Forest Programme in Ireland. And we're joined by Kay Sennett, who's a, um, an educator and horticulturist um, and works uh, uh, yes, very welcome everyone to our lunchtime webinar. Um, the part I will be talking about is rewilding. And I have divided the uh, talk into three parts. The first part is talking about the bigger picture of rewilding, then about our personal individual part that we can take in rewilding, and then a few practical tips and hints on how you can go about rewilding. So what is rewilding? As such, there is no definition of uh, <clears throat> what it is, but it's been around since the early 90s when ecologists and scientists mostly were talking about rewilding. And then in 2013, George Monbiot uh, published a book called Feral that talked extensively about rewilding. And that put the whole concept in the more public domain and people started getting a little bit more interested in <clears throat> the whole aspect of rewilding. So there's no definition, but we can describe what it is. So one of the things it is, it's a progressive approach to conservation. Conservation is really not good enough anymore. Conservation is about keeping things the way they are. But we're beyond that now. We'll have to start looking back and start thinking about how things should be. Uh, it is about letting nature take care of itself. It's referred to as self-regulation. It's about enabling natural processes to shape the landscape, about repairing damaged ecosystems, about restoring de degraded landscapes. So in a nutshell, that's what uh, rewilding is aiming to do. Why are we doing this? We're doing this because nature really knows best, but it does need a helping hand before it can self-regulate and look after itself. And that's where <clears throat> the rewilding that we do does come in. Rewilding is also about um, key native species being reintroduced. So Yellowstone National Park has seen the reintroduction of wolves. They've been reintroduced into some European countries as well and quite successfully so. Now, we haven't seen wolves in Ireland yet, and I don't know whether we will, but we have reintroduced species like white-tailed eagles, eagles and golden eagles and so on. But that's more uh, a general approach of rewilding. That's not really what the individual is, is doing as such, but it's, it's a very, very important part of rewilding. Modern society, and I'm really talking both rural and urban, needs to reconnect with the wilder nature. And um, I'm, I'm including rural in that because people in rural areas are often quite as removed from nature as people in urban areas are. Essential, um, rewilding is essential for the future of both people and wildlife. This is not just about preserving wildlife, but this is about ourselves as well, because rewilding counters climate change and biodiversity loss. These are two challenges, two major challenges that we're facing at the moment. And rewilding in, ensures a cleaner environment as well. Ireland has seen so far a few interesting rewilding projects, the largest of which is Wild Neffin in County Mayo. It's located in the Ballycroy National Park, um, a lot of which is bogland and the Neffin uh, forest, which is managed by Creature. There's other projects as well. Dunsany Nat uh, Nature Reserve in County Meath is a private estate that has been, um, been a project of rewilding and they're very active on social media. So if you're interested, you can follow them and see what they're doing. Another example is uh, Mount Lucas Wind Farm and Peatland in County Offaly. Very well known is the Burn Programme, Farming for Con Conservation, and that is I don't know, probably going on for the last 20 years or so. And this, um, any of you living in the west of Ireland might recognise it. It's an aerial shot of a part of Galway City. What you're looking at there is Quincentennial Bridge and 
marked out in red is Terryland Forest Park. So that's interesting enough to have a park that size because it extends right across the city um, in the middle of a city. But now there is an initiative to make Galway or to get the allocation of um, a national park city for Galway. So at the moment, there are only two cities in the world that have uh, this prestigious name. London was the first in the world and Adelaide has recently been added and Galway is looking to, to join their ranks as well, which would be a fantastic initiative. So to see where we want to go, we really have to look back. Um, looking back is the way forward. Ireland used to be about 80% temperate rainforest and the rest of it was wetland and, uh, and bogs. And this is before people were called, uh, were, were, um, were arriving in Ireland and, and changing the landscape. Today, it looks quite different. Today, we're left with about 11% woodland cover in the whole of Ireland. And on less than 2% of that is actually native woodland. Most of what you see, unfortunately, is what you see in the picture. So they're um, conifer plantations and they're planted so densely, there's no um, room left, uh, no habitat left for fauna and flora to flourish. 72% of our land mass now is uh, taken over by farmland and 85% of Irish habitats have unfavourable conservation status and nearly 50% of those habitats are in decline. Now, I don't like usually throwing a lot of statistics out at people, but they're so stark and I think we just need to take stock and, and take note of them and um, see that that is not sustainable. How do we get to these degraded landscapes? It's obviously the pressure of agriculture and livestock production because we all have to eat. It's urbanization, we have to live somewhere. It's deforestation and exploitation sorry, of bogs. And it also is something that is in all of us to a point. It's the disconnect from nature. And that's where, you know, rewilding is something that uh, should be close to all of our hearts a lot more. So this disconnect from nature, this has very serious effects for our health and well-being, both for our physical and our mental health. And also um, it leads to a lack of understanding of nature. If we don't understand nature, we can't value it. And if you don't value nature, we are not going to protect it. There's an interesting quote by a Senegalese um, ecologist and it says, in the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand. We will understand only what we are taught. So what we will have to do is we have to teach ourselves, we have to teach others so that we will be able to understand better. And once we understand better, we will be able to love things and then protect them and conserve them. So with that in mind, where do we start? And what I usually suggest to people is we start with our own person. We start rewilding ourselves, which may sound a bit strange at first. But what that is about, it's about reconnecting and using all our senses. We have lost that ability to use our senses. It's about taking the time to stop, to sit, to listen and smell what's around you, to touch and taste. There's plenty of plants in the wild that are edible, that you could forage, that you can actually taste. But most importantly, look, see and ID. So looking is one thing, but actually seeing what's there is another thing. And then being able to put a name to those things, to identify them and to see what, um, what is important about them. Nick Baker, the nat UK naturalist, uh, calls that honing your sensory toolkit. And it's a, it's a skill that we've largely lost. If you're interested, he has written a book about rewilding, and this is a rewilding yourself. And uh, it's widely av available, and I would really, really recommend that if you're interested in rewilding yourself. So what's next? <clears throat> when we're rewilding ourselves, our attitude needs to change. A lot of our problems are down to social conditioning. Social conditioning makes us see this as a weed and this as a pest. 
when the first picture of the dandelion, to me, that is a very valuable native Irish wildflower uh, that appears early in the season, they're up already, and it provides pollen and nectar to a lot of insects. And the second creature is actually very important for ecosystems as well. And I was absolutely delighted when I <clears throat> read an article last week that the Royal Horticultural Society in the UK have now decided not to see slugs and snails as pests anymore. Um, they stated that of the 44 or so uh, species of slugs in the UK, only nine actually do damage to living plants. All the rest of them are doing very important jobs for the ecosystem. And that's what we need. We need to, we need to change our attitudes and we need to shake off that conditioning that we've been subjected to. So with that in mind, we need to stop and reduce comp compartmentalizing nature. Nature here or a nice and neat garden there, maybe a nice park over there. It all needs to be intermingling and nature will have to come in into all these places. We have to stop and reduce tiding and overall we have to reduce our controlling of what is around us. We need to relinquish this control. So when it comes to rewilding, the power is with the people. I promise this is my last statistic, but because I live in Galway, uh, it always strikes me. Over 60% of households in County Galway are one-off houses. That's the highest percentage in Ireland. It looks like something like this. To me, that has huge rewilding potential. Because if you look at it collectively, all those gardens can provide a vast can provide nice natural habitats. So each garden, you know, each garden backs onto another person's garden and another person's garden. And the wildlife that visits your gardens is not going to stay in just one. They'll move along. So they can to provide really good wildlife corridors that are, <coughs> excuse me, really essential for wildlife as well. So that's where we fit in. Um, when it comes to more practical tips and hints and everything else that uh, might be important. First of all, we can do some passive rewilding. And passive rewilding is all about letting things be. Be less tidy in the garden. So, for instance, instead of burning or, or dumping your, your garden clippings, you can put them into a dead hedge and it creates a habitat and it gets rid of what you might want in the garden and divides your garden up a little bit. Uh, you can delay and tidy and clearing borders. I don't do that in the, the autumn at all. I start clearing borders in the spring when the temperature is reliably, reliably above 10 degrees Celsius when um, you know the, uh, uh, the creatures that might be living or hibernating or sheltering there don't need that anymore. You can leave seed heads for overwintering birds and you can leave some leaf litter on the ground over winter. It keeps up the temperature and again that's very important for, for insects and invertebrates that might be sheltering there. And then leave some room for decay, be it as a dead hedge and the picture on the right or just leaving some stumps to decay. And very importantly, don't cut your hedges between the 1st of March and 31st of August. That rule is not only there for the county councils, but you know we should really have to obey to these rules as well. Another example of passive rewilding is to interfere less. And the example I give there is lawns, just mow less frequently. We don't mow our lawn any more than maybe every two weeks. Sometimes there's bigger gaps in between. The All Ireland Pollinator Plan last year promoted the No Mow May, where they were asking people to park their lawnmowers for the month of May because that's the time when a lot of wildflowers will emerge and um, that all that pollen and nectar will be available to butterflies and uh, bees and other pollinators. Don't feed your lawns. If you feed your lawns or leave the grass clippings on your lawn, that will inadvertently feed the lawn and uh, you in increase the grasses that come up and you won't get the flowers. Um, another way of passive rewilding is letting grass grow altogether, don't cut it at all. 
So if you could find a part in your garden where you could leave the grass grow all year long and maybe trim it once a year. When I, what I usually say to um, people that live maybe in housing estates and uh, the green area um, is, is, is often contentious. Some people want it mowed, some people want to leave it wild. But if an area of grass is surrounded by a mowed strip or this, this, this path going through, that can appease people a little bit because it makes it look a little bit more as if it's left by design rather than by neglect. But leaving that grass is really important because you will end up with 10 times more species of fauna in there and 50 times more individuals. So it provides lots of nesting sites as well. This is a picture of our own garden and what you're looking at there is our orchard area. It's surrounded by um, trees that we planted as a shelter belt and then in the centre you have a grass area and apple, pear and plum trees and um, it makes a nice feature in the garden as well. Allow wildflowers to emerge as our dandelions again. So it's not only flowers that we're interested in but we're also interested in the seeds. If you leave those seed heads, you will have goldfinches and bullfinches especially visit the garden. Bullfinches are birds that you don't see very often because they don't visit bird tables and bird feeders. So um, sometimes the only time you can see them is when the dandelions go to seed and they come and visit the garden in pairs and, and eat those seeds. Brambles are also not very liked by people and gardeners. But not only do they provide food to their leaves and their fruits, but uh, the thicket of, of brambles will give fantastic nesting spaces to ground nesting birds. So they're very important as well to have somewhere. Docks, again, is a, a wildflower, shall I say, that people don't usually like very much. They're very hard to get rid of if, if you were that way inclined. But sorrels that are related to docks, for example, are the only caterpillar food plant for the small copper butterfly. So that is a really important point because the pollinator plant sometimes leads you to believe that all you need is pollen and nectar in the garden to get the butterflies. But if the caterpillars don't have food plants like nettles and docks and other plants, then, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not, I wouldn't say pointless to have the flowers, but um, you will not get certain types of butterflies because they won't have food for their, for their larvae. And ivy is another one that divides people, but um, ivy flowers very late in the season, September, October. So it's a very late last source of pollen and nectar. And then because it flowers late, late the, the berries don't come up till about February. And that's the hungry gap for the birds when all the other berries are gone they can still um, feed on uh, the ivy berries. I always call this the good, the bad and the ugly. Who doesn't like uh, a, a robin? Everybody loves a robin. But uh, when it comes to spiders, people are more divided. And uh, I'd say I know more people that absolutely dislike wasps than people that would actually say they like wasps. I do like them. They're a very sociable insect and they eat huge amounts of aphids. So the gardener's friend. The only time they get a little bit pesky is kind of in late summer when they're when they're being starved out of, of their, their, their hive and um, they get a little bit annoying then. And the slugs and the snails we already mentioned, they all have their place and we should really respect them, whether we like them or not. They have, you know, an important job to do for us. Another tip is to go organic, no pesticides, that includes insecticides and herbicides should be used in the garden. And you should really only be very selective with natural remedies. A lot of people are always looking for alternatives to the, the simplest way um, to change is to find an alternative. But sometimes we just have to think about doing without. And those natural remedies, they can actually do harm to um, predators and uh, the good guys, should we say, as well. So instead, you should boost uh, natural predators through biodiversity. So if you're less tidy in your borders, you're likely to have hibernating um, 
ladybirds that eat huge amounts of eggs. It's them and their, their larvae both. Um, you could use barriers and resistant plants instead. And we can now also accept a little bit of crop damage. So, you know, obviously we want to protect our seedlings if we're gardeners, but once we have mature cabbages, if the outer leaves are damaged, so be it, it doesn't look perfect, but we, we're not likely to eat the outer leaves anyway. Um, another thing is to increase biodiversity, increase biodiversity in general. So the variety of different types of plants, but you have to make informed choices. So the pollinator or all a pollinator plan has a lot of very good resources on their website. It's just pollinators.ie. For instance, they have a pollinator friendly planting code and that planting code lists both native Irish wildflowers and suitable ornamental flowers as well that would be good for pollinators. And I know a lot of people are very keen on those wildflower meadows and wildflower mixes. Wildflower meadows are not very indigenous to Ireland. And a lot of the times those commercial mixes that you buy have plants in there that are neither wild nor native. And uh, worst case scenario is that they have seeds of invasive plants as happened last year when it was discovered there was black grass seeds in <clears throat> some of those mixes. And uh, if they get into a tillage farm, that kind of devastating effects for those farmers and that's something you don't want either. So if you are keen on, on a wildflower a meadow look, maybe restricted to, you know, close to the house or somewhere, but don't introduce them into semi-wild or wild areas. Um, one of the last points to make, I suppose, is to try and create as many habitats and nesting and hibernation opportunities. And one of the best things you can do is to introduce water to the garden. So you mightn't have the space, the time or the money for a big pond like that. But even a small container pond is a very useful addition to the garden. Um, we're in the process of making a proper pond and uh, I have one of those container ponds on the patio and all winter long I have been entertained by birds taking a little drink and having a little bath in there. It's been a very, very busy place. In urban areas especially, <clears throat> excuse me, you can put up uh, bird nesting boxes or bat roosting boxes. In, you know, country areas, I would say, you know, try and create those habitats and, and nesting opportunities by planting. Um, go native, as native as possible. Native fauna has co-involved with native flora. They respond to the plant's colour, scent, size and location, much more so than to ornamental plants and um, they thrive on a particular suite of species as well. So if certain plants are growing together uh, and they're native, it would be, you know, the best, best case scenario. A mature oak tree supports 290 species of birds, mammals, invertebrates and plants in Ireland. Uh, that is, you know, one of our best, I guess, native trees. Um, planting native trees and hedgerows, because we don't have many woodlands, the hedgerows, you know, are a, a good substitute, I guess. They, they create wildlife corridors. Um, they give you places for roosting, sh uh, sheltering and nesting. Uh, they provide food, as I mentioned already, the wildlife corridors. So to maintain them, to plant them is uh, very important. And of course, they help to fight climate change. So lastly, I would always say to people, surround yourself by nature. This is another photograph from our garden. And as you can see, I'm also fond of some ornamental plants, their, their colour, their vibrancy. But that's in the centre of the garden. That's close to the house. And if you look in, closely in that picture, you see further on, you see the native trees, um, you see woodland cover. Um, what you don't see so much is our, our high grass and our brambles and, and all the rest. But if you, if you keep your cultivated plants close to you and then as you go out further and further to the borders of your, of your property, you know, it should get wilder and, uh, and looser that way. In summary, um, just to, to recap on those points, interfere less and be less tidy, increase biodiversity, 
introduce more native plants, garden organically, allow nature to take a hold. I specifically didn't say take over. You know, I'm not asking people to, to allow, you know, their gardens to go completely wild. You know, if they could, and if they would, it would certainly be helpful, but I know people wouldn't probably like to do that, but let nature take a hold somewhere in the garden. And then appreciate what you have, learn about it, and most importantly, spread the word. Okay. Um, fascinating uh, talk, Kay, thank you very much. I think, um, well, I hope our talks will have a lot of crossover. Um, and yes, reconnecting with nature, that's certainly what I'll be talking about. It's what I suppose the main aim of our two programmes are about. Um, so my name is Rachel Geary and I am I oversee the Learning About Forest programme and the Quill Bjog Initiative. Um, LEAF itself, or Learning About Forest, is an international programme of the Foundation for Environmental Education. So similar to the Green Schools programme, if you're familiar with that. And then on Quill Bjog is an initiative of LEAF, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, so I'm going to look at outdoor education, what it is, and use our two programmes then as examples to highlight the benefits of out learning outdoors. The roots of outdoor education, as we know today, have um, an old origin as they date back to the early days of school camping trips. Um, but the term was first officially introduced then in the 40s and became more popular during the 60s thanks to the emergence of environmental education programmes such as LEAF, our own programme. Outdoor learning is one of the pillars of outdoor education and it begins the moment you step outside your door. Um, so it includes an array of actions. There's a list of them here, I'll call out a few. Outside playtime, school grounds projects, environmental education, recreational and adventure activities, personal social development programs, expeditions, team building, and the list goes on. And I guess the main unifying element of all these different forms of outdoor learning and education is their location. They're all performed outside and in nature. Um, there's been a lot of studies carried out throughout the years and they identify um, several positive effects that derive from outdoor education as highlighted, I guess, in this statement here um, from 2006, experience of the outdoors and wilderness has the potential to confer a multitude of benefits on young people's physical development, emotional and mental health, and well-being and social development. Mental health and well-being benefits from play in natural settings appear to be long-term realized in the form of emotional stability in young adulthood. So um, lots of positives there. So just um, to give you a little background or insight to our own programmes, um, LEAF. Um, LEAF we ran in County Limerick for four years during 2016 and 2020. And during that period, we would have worked with 63 schools, mostly primary, some secondary. <clears throat> and then we also worked with Mary I, the teacher training college in Limerick. Now we generally worked with one classroom per school which would have been an average of about 30 students. Um, so that was 142 classes over this time period. And that's um, just over three and a half thousand students in that four year period. And in that same four year period, we would have planted almost 4,000 trees between both our programs, LEAF and Quail Bjog. So in relation to how we worked the program, um, we were very lucky to have sufficient funding to be able to bring each of these schools to the forest. So they would have all received four hours in the forest, which was spent entirely outdoors, regardless of the weather. Now, unless there was an actual weather warning. <laughs> um, so that equated to almost 600 hours outdoors over that four year period. And then we also held school-based workshops. And again, these were four hours long but there was a mix of indoor and outdoor activities. So that was um, just almost 300 hours working outdoors in these school-based workshops. Um, in this case, we would use the school grounds where possible. And if there was no green space, we would coordinate with the teachers and look for a green area near the school. 
During these workshops, we would have um, done a range of different activities that cover the LEAF theme, such as climate, biodiversity, products um, and community. And these are all very much hands-on projects or activities that would have tied in with the curriculum, such as maths, geography, um, art, etc. Now, since COVID, I would say that we've moved all our workshops entirely outdoors. So the funding for the Leaf Limerick project ran out in 2020, um, and we're currently running, I suppose, a slimmed down version of that. And unfortunately, this funding doesn't allow us to bring the students to the forest. So we're working entirely on the school, school grounds. When we think of um, outdoor education or outdoor learning, I suppose there's some questions or things to consider that might come up. So there's possible obstacles, perceived barriers, and then we might ask ourselves why are children spending less time outdoors? And um, Kay would have touched on this, um, you know, this reconnecting with nature and I suppose the importance of it and why we need to try and overcome these barriers and obstacles. So LEAF, I suppose we feel very strongly about bringing students outdoors and um, because we feel it's the best place for them to learn about nature. And of course, it can often be a lot more fun. Um, we're also aware that the students today are spending less time outdoors for numerous different reasons. Um, the slide here just highlights some of them. Um, so, of course, we're all familiar with the um, increased amount of time on our screens. I don't think it's just the young students guilty of that. We're all guilty of it. Um, location for some may be an issue. Some of our students would live in the city and many would have had little or no exposure to the natural environment. Um, Kay mentioned, actually, even in rural areas, this can also be a problem. Um, so there's also an increase in the amount of um, structured activities, for example, camps and various after school clubs, etc. There's anxieties on behalf of the teachers and parents around safety. Um, and then also we would have <clears throat> um, anxieties around, sorry, the safety and pl safe places to play. So just to give you an example on this particular point, we would have brought students to the forest where students are sorry, where the paths would have crisscrossed for walking and cycling. And just off any of these paths would have been, let's say, wilder or more adventurous places for the students to explore. But they were still very safe just off the beaten path. And the teachers that we worked with, they often commented that they would have brought their own children to the same forest and always stuck to the paths and just never thought to take them off the path and a little bit deeper into the forest where they could um, explore for themselves. So all these contributing factors basically mean that children spend less time outdoors learning. Um, one of the teachers commented that um, she said they were living in, that we are all living in very trans transitory times, child obesity, video games and sedentary lifestyles. And in a lot of cases, so much of the child stimulation is actually coming from screen time. Um, so what are the issues with all of this then? Um, spending less time learning outdoors often goes hand in hand with less physical activities. And so some of the issues that we would come across by working with the schools is um, obesity and actually something that I, I haven't included on the list here, but something we would have seen quite a lot is when we do bring the students off the path, um, they often, for many of them, there was a lack of coordination over uneven surfaces or doing something as simple as, well, what many of us might look as, as a simple task as climbing a fence. Very often the children just didn't have the skills to do these things. Um, and it might be hard for some of us to believe, especially if we've grown up in the countryside and we're exposed to the outdoors when we were young. But this is a real problem for many of the students that we would have worked with. Um, Teachers often report also that students today have lower concentration levels. They're easily distracted, again, maybe sometimes associated to screen time. Um, and finally, there's a lack of con contact with the natural world. Again, reiterating what Kay mentioned there. So spending less time outdoors, then this often leads to a lack of understanding of the natural world. Um, we feel very strongly that we must ensure that students learn to enjoy and even more importantly, have positive experiences outdoors in order to develop this positive attitude toward the environment and understand the natural world a bit better. And again, going back to the quote that Kay shared, hopefully then looking to protect that natural world. 
Um, so how can we address these problems um, from our perspective it, with our own programs again on a very basic level the amount of time we spend outdoors doing our workshops we limit um, the more traditional presentations such as powerpoints and we would hope that exposing the, the children or students to nature this would lead to an increased interest in nature and therefore potentially a greater want or desire to be outdoors. Um, as mentioned then as well all participating schools would have visited the forest during that four-year period now we're using the grounds themselves and we coordinate with the teachers to find a nearby green area. And better still, thanks to funding that we've received, we're now actually planting little woodlands in schools across the country, providing these schools with an outdoor classroom on site. And I'm gonna talk about that in a moment. Um, the other um, obstacle that we touched on was anxieties and perceptions around safety. They vary quite a bit from school to school. Some have very strict rules about running and play in general, while others then can be often much more relaxed. And I'm sure the same can be said for many households as well. Um, so as a rule, our staff would have a very high level of health and safety training, and this would always be, um, in, the teachers would be informed of this at the beginning of our workshops. Um, and we would also give a health and safety talk prior to any workshop beginning. So I suppose you might ask yourself, why, why is that so important? But being informed and being prepared is the first step towards reducing anxieties around safety. And it is important then for them to feel safe in nature, for one to really reap the benefits, the mental and physical benefits of being outdoors and learning outdoors. So feeling safe is a very important part of that. Then finally, in relation to the increased amount of structured play, um, all our workshops are very loosely structured around our activities. They're adaptable depending on age and ability, group size, etc. And we always allow a little bit of free time then for our students to explore their natural surroundings. So you might then look at how we can, uh, or how, sorry, how you might facilitate some outdoor learning in your setting. Um, so we look at the steps, I suppose, that we assess what, what do you want to achieve in the outdoor session. Planning ahead is crucial. The activities, plan them in advance where possible, linking in with your outdoor learning goals, whatever they might be. Um, prepare, checking the weather and the location in advance is obviously very important, especially with our climate. Um, leading then, giving the change of environment from classroom setting, it's important to lead the learning outdoors with activities, tasks and learning goals. Um, and I suppose I don't want to get too caught up in um, very strict kind of leading these activities, but um, have some sort of a plan in place when you're going out, especially if you yourself are uncertain about or teaching outdoors. Evaluate, so once you've tried your learning outdoors, um, learn from it yourself, what worked, maybe what didn't work, um, what do you need to change maybe for your next outdoor session? Um, always, if you're going into a new area, if you're going to the local park or the local forest, whatever it might be, always worthwhile doing a risk assessment. Um, look at the equipment that you might need. It might be something as simple as just clipboards or magnifying glasses, but making sure, again, it kind of comes back to the previous point of being prepared. Um, in Ireland, I don't think we can avoid <laughs> the weather that we have and clothing is a big part of being prepared. We would have been working, as I say, for those four hours, um, possibly three, four times a week with these students and clothing or poor, poor clothing was one of the biggest issues that we came across. Um, so that's something that really needs to change in Ireland and making sure that we have appropriate clothing to go outdoors and feel comfortable outdoors and enjoy the whole experience because there's nothing worse than being outdoors cold and wet and miserable. Children won't learn, they won't have fun and they'll just want, they just won't want to do it again. Um, and then creating a space. So again, if you're going to be teaching or doing any kind of wellness or anything outdoors, it's always nice if possible to have seating area. This could be something as simple as just wooden logs and ideally some form of shelter again. Not always possible, but I, ideally seating and shelter would be great. Um, in relation to all those things that I've just talked about, Green Schools and LEAF teamed up to produce this um, 
short, very short outdoor learning um, handbook during the during the lockdowns. So I think Dara or Rob might be able to share you the link there, but it basically kind of summarizes all the different things that we've touched on um, with outdoor learning and the obstacles, as I say. So um, what are the benefits of the LEAF program? I could sit here and tell you my opinion about all the benefits of the programs, but I think it's really the teachers that see the benefits after we've left, after we've finished our workshops. So we would always ask the teachers to do a little bit of a review for us. And when we looked at the, their feedback, the teachers feel that there's improved concentration from spending time outdoors. It builds the students' confidence. Children are able to enjoy the natural world around them a little bit more because they have an appreciation for it. Um, they also mentioned learning without the restrictions of the walls and desks, active learning for students, and then really important, tapping into students' innate love for nature and the sense of wonder, which again, we've lost and Kate talked about that, this disconnect with nature. Yeah, oh, much they loved it and seen squirrels, they're still talking about a red squirrel. Never seen one, never heard one, you know, before. And they were a bit apprehensive about going to the forest because they were like, oh, it's not a really cool place to go. But then they actually really loved it, like, you know, because some of them from the city may not have ever experienced going out to Curry Chase. Gosh, they got to see so many things out there. Like for a school that is Limerick City, and they have a lot of different backgrounds, we, they don't get to experience what we would. They couldn't get over it, like, they remembered so many things. Yeah. Children can see pictures of nature and YouTube clips of nature, but there's nothing as good as getting out into the open and getting hands-on experiences. We had a project called the Tiny Forest Project. We planted 400 trees of all native Irish varieties and um, it took two days to do it. It was just absolutely brilliant. Um, every child got to plant a tree and even the children you would least expect were highly motivated during those two days. Beautiful sunny day and it was just, it was like a hive of activity. You know, they link the web of life, they link what they can do to help, you know, the environment. Giving children some freedom when they're outside really pays dividends, it builds their confidence. So we would have give, shown them how to plant a tree, for example, during the tiny forest planting and then let them off and do it themselves. You know, it really links in with well-being, like mindfulness, you know, it was just, a great experience for a lot of them and even the livelier children you know you know it's a very calming experience for them and they loved it like hopefully you know it'll create you know people in the future that are you know ready to help the world and like you know invest their time in helping the environment again some of them don't experience anything outside the city they don't yeah. experience anything outside their apartment unfortunately and that's just the way it is so to get them out there is, it's really, uh, I can't recommend it enough to be honest. Uh. Okay, so in that little video, you'd have heard the teacher mention the tiny forest being planted. Um, the tiny forest initiative is what we started out thinking we would do, but it's actually a little bit more restrictive. So we, I took this, was took the idea and we um, adapted it um, and we made our own um, program called On Quill Bjork, which is the Irish for Little Woodland. Um, the Tiny Forest Initiative was patented and it, it was very much about planting trees and excluding people and leaving it for biodiversity, which of course is very important in some situations, but for us we felt we actually want the woodlands to be used as an outdoor site, so that's why we changed it up a little bit. Um, so what does Unquil Bjog mean? I mentioned that it's a little woodland and we've been planting these since 2017. So Quil Bjogs are small, dense, biodiverse native woodland habitats and they're planted in schools and potentially in community settings. These sites are planned, planted and managed by the students and teachers of the schools. And this is really important part that the students are involved in the entire process because it encourages a greater sense of ownership. Um, the intention then is that these quail biogs are used as outdoor living classrooms with spaces created for seating, which you can see there in the bottom photo on that slide. Um, so just a circular area within the woodland and in some situations they'll put in seating themselves. So these habitats provide an educational and recreational resource for the whole school community and it enables students then to participate in programs like LEAF, our own programme, 
citizen science, woodland skills, nature connection, and well-being. Um, so in 2017-18, we would have planted six of these little woodlands in Limerick schools. Then COVID put an abrupt halt to all of that. Um, and we're back in schools now again, and we're currently planting 12 of these little woodlands in the schools um, across Ireland. So we're outside of Limerick now again. Um, the school that you heard mentioning, or the school the teacher you heard on the video clip there was from Skull War Her Day, and she mentioned the 400 trees. We've changed that slightly now, and we're putting in more closer to about 200 trees in each site. Um, normally, the space that's planted is about 200 metres squared with mixed native species. And we always look at the um, soil type before we go in and do any planting. If the ground is very wet, we might plant it up with more alder and birch, these maybe willow as well. So we it's all it's very much site specific. In some schools, then they'll look at having maybe more of a linear woodland with a little cluster at the end. So again, depending on what's available in school grounds. The top picture there on this slide shows um, the students admiring all their hard work after the tree planting and the mulching. Um, you can see the classroom space there, the circular space in the centre. And then over time, of course, we would encourage schools to develop little nature trails. Um, in the bottom picture there, you can see educational signage. So this is very important as well that we put up these signs explaining what the woodland is about and the species that can be found. And then around the outdoor classroom, we try to put a mix of the native species and we put these smaller signs so these can be a talking point for the teachers to learn that each class might pick a particular species and um, focus on that, that species over the course of the year. Um, during the summertime, and you even saw it in case pictures, these trees, of course, provide beautiful canopy and it helps keep the students and teachers cool during the warm weather whenever we get it. And <laughs> um, you can see in the next slide here, there in the bottom picture, the students enjoying the classroom space there. So again, going back to the teacher's perspective and what they felt are the benefits of the Quill Biog programme were, they mentioned that it makes it easier to incorporate outdoors into the curriculum. It encourages students to foster an interest in their local and natural environment. They learn lifelong skills. A lot of these students would never have planted trees. Um, it encourages teamwork and there's a greater sense of ownership and responsibility. And then finally, of course, it links in with the wellbeing programmes, in particular in the secondary schools. Um, so I suppose the big difference with the Quill Biog programme, as opposed to a lot of the tree planting programmes that are happening across the country, we educate right from the very start. We involve and engage in the whole process, the soil tests, the site map, the planning, everything, um, as opposed to just the planting, which of course is very important in itself. Um, this is a very short vi video of Skull Water Day. We actually just took it the other day. Um, and I suppose as you're watching the video, it's only a couple of seconds long, just to um, note how the space is around the rest of the school. It's concrete and it's mowed grass. And then the camera spans over the woodland. Now it's, it's just a few days ago, so it's not in leaf, but it, hopefully it'll give you an idea of what we've been doing over the last few years. So a little patch on those school grounds rewilded, I think. Um, and what I suppose when we first visit the schools, we're, we're, we're always thinking big. And in some cases, it might be scaled back a little bit. But the idea is that over time that we will break down these barriers with schools about trying to keep things neat and tidy. And hopefully over time, maybe in in three week next year, the school themselves might take the initiative to plant a little bit more, maybe plant a little corridor down towards the front of the gate there again. And we would always be encouraging this in schools that they essentially start rewilding their school grounds. Um, 
this is again one of our woodland that we planted back in 2018 now ignoring the the more mature tree in the middle of that picture but the woodland that you see in the rest of the photo is was put in in 2018 you can see the height of the trees there that was a really wet wet site so we put in a lot of alder and birch there but just the reason I put in this photo is just to show you how this school is really using their site. They put in the benches there. They even have a campfire and they've actually even got a pizza oven in that um, little woodland. So they're really embracing the whole outdoor classroom, outdoor education. Um, it's, it was fantastic to see. So they're the schools that we would have worked with. And again, I suppose crossing back over to Kay's um, presentation, you don't need a big space to create sites for outdoor learning and outdoor education. If you've got space in your garden, you can cordon off a little patch um, with some logs, plant some native trees in there. And all of a sudden, maybe not only your children, but you might find you'll be going out and exploring what's in there. These are just um, old images from our garden. We wanted to screen off that back wall, so we planted native woodland. Again, the photos, um, the, the canopy isn't there, but that space for us now has become a real area for eating during the summer, for exploring. We put in a little pond area. So it's, again, just about creating these spaces in your homes, in your schools, and in your communities, which is also possible. This is um, a woodland that was put in just up the road from us here. Again, involving the people, the, the residents of the community right from the very start, putting in paths through these woodland areas so that you can actually go in and learn and explore. Um, <clears throat> in the next photo here, actually, it's the same woodland. So the photo there that you see um, with the group with their shovels and the trees, that was the year it went in. And the second photo was taken around the same location just two years on. And now basically we're using this woodland as a site for education. We have woodland walks and talks there. Again, so creating these spaces, not just for biodiversity and for climate action, but for ourselves to learn, to enjoy, to explore with families, friends and children. Um, almost finished folks, just, just to let you know that we are continuously developing resources. Um, we have our leaf resources, we've our quail biog resources, they can be interchanged over the two programmes, um, but they're all available on our website. Again, Rob will probably share the link with you there. Um, and just finally, to finish off the presentation, again, more feedback from one of the teachers that we would work, we worked with back in Limerick. Um, we can gather figures relating to the numbers of hours spent, and this is often what um, people want to hear, the sponsors, etc. But at the end of the day, it's the teachers, again, that are going back to the classrooms with the students and noticing the changes in their behaviour and their well-being. Um, so this quote here is just from a fourth class teacher in St. Bridget's National School. Outdoor education helps to alleviate mood and do decrease anxiety, as it is a welcomed change to hours of sitting at a desk indoors. The children become more active, which makes them healthier and happier, which in turn means they can do better academically. Learning about nature appeals to the senses as children get the opportunity to see, smell, hear and touch the world around them. So I guess that nicely summarises um, the benefits of outdoor education and outdoor learning. And that's it. Thank you very much.